and uh, we're bringing a social justice production here from Broadway entitled uh, Justice on Trial. I want you to look at somebody real quick and say justice is still on trial. We see it in the news almost every day. This production deals with two civil rights attorneys that are suing the U.S. Justice Department for reparations and ongoing systemic racism issues within the African-American diaspora. Therefore, we bring back time traveler witnesses such as Harriet Tugman, Medgar Evers, Emmett Till, and Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois to tell their stories to a modern day multicultural jury, blacks, whites, and Hispanics. And they deliberate their stories all the way up into George Floyd or whatever is current in the news. You know, pastor, there was a time that they made it illegal for slaves to read. Now they're trying to make it illegal for us to read about slaves. We shall never forget where we come from. Come on, somebody. We have to continue to tell the story that we were not slaves brought over here, but we were kings and queens brought over here made to be slaves. And so having said that, it's, it's produced, executive produced by yours truly, Chad Lawson Cooper from a number of TV shows and movies, Hanging with Mr. Cooper, the TV reality show, most recent, and uh, Harry Lennox, uh, my other co-producer from The Blacklist or uh, a plethora of movies, Ray Charles, you name it. But we've put together an amazing cast that's going to bless you on that evening. Uh, ha Harriet Tugman's character is played by my wife, Alicia Robinson Cooper, lead singer for John P. Key in the VIP Choir. The character of W.E.B. Du Bois is actually played by his blood grandson, Jeffrey Du Bois Peck. It's very, very impactful. Now, because this is a social justice play, and we've been the only play that's been endorsed by the United States Congress in terms of what we do, we work with the uh, agency that, that works with the White House that allows us to find people in different communities that we can honor for their work in their communities. And let me tell you, your pastor, uh, uh, I, was, I was in <laughs> Tampa and met a pastor Reed and heard about Pastor Manaway. <laughs> and so uh, your pastor's name and his, his prowess in the gospel community is nationwide. And so we'll be honoring him that day with the Presidential Lifetime Achievement Award from the White House from President Biden's office for his lifelong work in the community. <laughs> and, and having said that, Pastor, here are two complimentary VIP tickets for you and your lovely bride. Yes, sir. My pleasure. <laughs> That's the highest award that one can receive from the White House without being an enlisted uh, person in the military. So we're honored to do that. Now, somebody holler. Now, and I want to tell you this. It's not so serious that you're not going to laugh. In this production, there's a in the jury deliberation, there's a, a white lady called Debbie Heckenbecker, who's a Trump supporter, and she starts off by saying, I don't see why in the world you blacks want something for something that happened 400 years ago. There's a black lady on the jury that says, what you mean happened 400 years ago? It started 400 years ago, and it's still happening today. She says, wait a minute, did I ask you to say something? Now, what you need to do is fix me some coffee. Like your grandmother fixed my grandmother some coffee. Because you're going to learn how to talk to a white woman in Seattle today. And the black woman in her calm, cool, collective way says, oh, yeah, and when you wake up from that coma I knock you into in the middle of the next week, you're going to learn how to talk to a black woman in Seattle today. So you get all of those accoutrements. But somebody holler discount tickets. The regular ticket price for VIP seating is $125. General seating is $100. But look at your neighbor and say, that ain't my price. When we partner with the ministry, we discount those tickets tremendously. The VIP tickets are discounted down to $87, general seating tickets down to $67. But somebody say, but if you are a senior citizen or an auxiliary member, you can take that ticket down another $10 and get your VIP seating, which comes with the reception at the end of the show, meet and greet the cast for $77, and general seating for 57 and if we're able to do somebody say 30 tickets we're going to donate an additional ticket 10 tickets to pastor manaway uh to bring 10 of the youth for free and, and we want to thank brother david and and sister um 
uh, Tasha Jones for connecting us today. Now, my wife will be here. Stand up, pretty wife. She'll, she'll be here at the, for the entirety of the service. You can see her afterwards, and Pastor Manaway, uh, he'll tell you if she's in the lobby or wherever he sets her up, and you can see uh, she and Tasha and get your tickets, debit card, credit card, cash, or check. In just 30 seconds of a little something that says, I need thee. I need thee every hour. I need thee. Bless you, brother. Y'all, you can come back and get the microphone. <laughs> My God. Well, good morning, Tabernacle family. Good morning to you on YouTube, Facebook, joining us. My name is Deacon Rodney Priolo, and I just want to stand before you just for a minute. From, <clears throat> excuse me, to give a brief announcement about the recovery ministry. The recovery ministry, <clears throat> the recovery ministry is responsible for providing recovery care to Tabernacle, Tabernacle, please contact the church office and provide the individual's name, addresses, and phone numbers of any individuals known to be ill at home, confined to the hospital, anticipating a surgical procedure, or in a nursing home. Once a week, a member from the recovery ministry will contact them either in person or by phone to provide recovery care for the duration of the illness. I thank you for your time. Please keep that in mind. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. morning church family don't lose all the luster because the man just started an earthquake up in here it it really was beautiful to hear about it, it reminded me of a recollection from yesterday afternoon we were talking about the capital campaign a little bit but we were talking about legacy and you spoke to that legacy sir thank you for doing that because this church it made me remember my life as a toddler I was brought into this church by some of the mothers and cared for it as a teenager, I came back as a refuge, and I was cared for. Then they put me to work. I became an usher. I became in the Youth Christian Board of Education, the Youth Executive Group. And I said all that to say this, and I got married, had children, and everything else right here in this house. And 37 years later, and a man of God and a man of software science was created and embodied in this house. And guess why? Because the people of this house decided to keep building and paying forward to the generations ahead. So in that speed, in that guide, I speak on the behalf of the Capital Campaign Group. My name is Moyer A. Fitz Breland. I am honored to stand before you to represent my chairperson and other members of the council that have worked diligently and are moving forward towards trying to set up our men's restroom and make it better. For everyone that comes in, for all these candid gentlemen like this, that when you open the door, you can be able to do it freely without worrying about getting your ribs cracked. 
it, it put everything in perspective and we're doing those things. Then secondarily, we want to do part two to the Randall Montgomery Fellowship Hall. We want to beautify it and make it to where when one one is in that moment, they have a restroom to serve them. Because many years ago, when the brothers used to meet on Saturdays, we had that restroom, but that was okay for the brothers back then. But where God is moving us to today, we have to step up. And guess in order to do that, we have to have your help. Next page to that would be the pastor's study and administration area. If all these gifts and greatness of God is doing it and we're, we're reviving our society from within, and this is a light that sits on the hill that cannot be hid, then we must do something better so that the administration can move forward and do it in a great way. And that's why, again, we need your help. And then the next part after those three things would be to make sure that the beautification on the outside is done that you can reach our facility and do it in a beautiful way. So it needs to be paid from front to back. And we can't do that without you. But we also work with you together because everybody on my committee is indebted to working hard, number one, for the service of God, secondarily for the service of our pastor and the future of the community that comes through these doors. And the ones not also because as I learned truly in black history, black history doesn't start within these walls. It comes in here to be reserved and renewed and refilled because guess what? We got to go back out and journey again. So thank you for your encounters this morning because I kept praying and asking God all night, what did you want me to say? But then when you said it, you confirmed my thought pattern. You were the confirmation for God to say, speak truly in the love of Christ. Thank you for allowing me to pour you today. God bless you. Good morning, family. I just stand before you briefly um, to remind you that we will be honoring uh, Miss Yvette Williams this coming Saturday at noon. Praise God. She is the lead vocalist on For Every Mountain, and we'll have um, a few of the Kirk Carr singers here with us. Um, tickets are only $20 in advance, and at the door, I believe there will be 30. Um, so we just want to love on her and pour, on her, pour into her a little bit. Is that all right? All right, so I believe we have a QR code, and then there's also the link on the Tabernacle event page, and yeah, we'll see you then. Good morning, Tabernacle. Good morning, Good morning Tabernacle. Good morning. We've had a lot of announcements today, but the number one was the public, assertion, uh, public assistance announcement. I need thee. Anybody out there, I need thee. Every minute and every hour. Y'all help me say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Saints. Don't be quiet now. I said praise the Lord, saints. Hey, we come to lift him up this morning. Hey, this is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. Hey, it look like we're surrounded. But we're surrounded by him. So this is how we fight our battles. Let's say praise the Lord, saints. That's what I'm talking about. It sounds like church up in here now. Uh, my name is Clussy Bagby, and we are here at the Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church, where we reside under Dr. Robert L. Manaway Sr. and First Lady Jessica P. Ryan Manaway. Let's give our pastor a hand. He deserves it. That's our pastor right there. Let's give our pastor a hand. And I'm here to welcome anybody here um, even if you've been here before, it don't have to be your first time. We're just here to say welcome. Anybody out there, we welcome you. And um, this is how we fight our battles. We praise God. Yeah. From whom all blessings flow. I say from whom all blessings flow. Somebody got to know what I'm talking about. Um, as we're standing for a scripture, all we need to do really is come in here and say three things. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because there's power in that name. There's no question there's power in that name. And um, the, word, the, the scripture will be coming from, um, from Revelations 3.20. Revelations 3.20. And you know what? I read it a couple times, and I had to go to the Amplified. Yeah, we're just coming out of Easter, and we know about resurrection. But res 
Uh, Revelations 3.20 reads, Behold, I stand at the door, and in parentheses it says, of the church, and continually knock. He didn't say I knock. He said I continually knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. And then parentheses it says, restore him, and he with me. So if we want to be restored, we're in the right place. And we got to continue to praise God because that's where whom all blessings flow. <laughs> Don't mind me. I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy this morning just to be here. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for your strength and your kindness. Thank you for anybody here that just reaches out and opens the door. Thank you for continually knocking, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. We say, Holy Spirit, have your way right now in this place. Your mercies are new every morning. We say hallelujah, Lord, because your grace is sufficient. We can do all things with you and nothing without you. So just have your way, Lord. Touch everybody to come to the podium. Touch the speaker of the day. Touch Sister Manaway wherever she sits. Bless her, Lord. Touch Joseph as he prays and every other preacher that proclaims your name. We love you, Lord. We say hallelujah, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for just being God all by yourself. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we bless you. And we ask all this in your wonderful most loving, most kind son, Jesus' name. We say amen and thank God. And as you're sitting down, say hallelujah, Lord. Amen. Can we give God a hand of praise in the room? Come on, like you mean it. Can we give God a hand of praise in the room? Anybody just feel like simply praising Him this morning? From the fruit of your lips. Let's go, y'all. Put it right here.
you give the Lord a hand clap of praise on this morning. I said give the Lord a hand clap of praise on this morning. If there's nobody like him, give him a nobody like him praise. If there's nobody like him, give him a nobody. You know what the Lord has done for you. You know how many doors he opened. You know how many ways he made. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. If you're able, please take your seats. God is just so mighty, awesome, and kind. Yeah. I've come here with intent on my heart on this morning. I've come here with intent on my mind on this morning. And I'm giving God all that's due. Because he's given me all and then some. And he keeps on blessing. And he keeps on making a way. My name, my name is Minister Paul Metellus. I'm here to lead us in our time of giving. God is just so gracious and so kind to us. There's so many things that we can give to on this morning, in addition and above in our tithes of offering. Our Operation Mustard Seed today is $10.24, and that goes to help fund professional development and other things that we're trying to do here at Tabernacle. Our mission gift emphasis for the month of April is going towards our youth ministry and helping to support the work that we do in our youth ministry. Thank you for those who have given not only to the uh, mission gift emphasis last month, last week, but also our Operation Mustard Seed. You've heard from uh, Brother Breland this morning about our capital campaign to renew your commitment or to give and amend your commitment that you've already given. And then we also have our debt retirement program. We're trying to make sure that we can pay off the Muskelly property. Amen. So there is a lot of good seed and good ground to sow into on this morning. Our scripture given for this morning is coming from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16. And um, it says, do not neglect to do good 
and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God that our giving on this morning pleases God. That is more than just, is, that's why giving is an act of worship because we're giving back to him what he has so graciously given to us. And that when we give sacrificially, we are most like him. And so when you give on this morning, give with that heart and that mindset and with a joyful and gleeful heart because that's how God gives to us, graciously, joyfully, and gleefully. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you. First, God, thank you for your loving kindness and your tender mercies. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you a portion. This is what you ask for, a portion of what you've given to us. And so, God, we first just want to thank you for the opportunity to get wealth, the opportunity to have a job, the opportunity to receive benefits. God, thank you. And now, God, as we so graciously give back to you what you've given to us, God, we ask that you bless our efforts on this morning. And we know your word is true, and your word says that when we give, there will never be any lack. So, God, we thank you for the overflow and the abundance, and we thank you for everything that you do to and towards and for us. Now, God, we ask that you bless the givers on this morning. Those who don't have tangibly to give, God, we ask that you redeem their time and their talents so that they may be participate in our giving efforts next time. We love you, we honor you, we praise you. In Jesus' holy, mighty, and precious name we pray. And we say thank God and amen. amen. Well, this is indeed a day that the Lord had made, and I tell you, we ought to continue to rejoice and be glad in it. If your hands work, put them together and give it to God just for a moment. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We are grateful to him. I don't know how many of us realize how blessed we are. I have my faculties that work. And I'm aware that if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? Wow, we are so grateful and thankful to him today. And I want to recognize our Lord for his grace and for his goodness and salvation to all of us, to the officers and laity of this wonderful congregation, for those who share with us virtually each week, you know, here in the States and around the world, thank God for you. Grateful for the life of my wife this morning, for her being uh, able to be here with us today. And sweethearts, I'm so, I'm so bad with names, but Seth Cooper, bless you, baby. I am so grateful. And uh, uh, your husband ain't right. He, 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 he need to be saved some more. He, 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 he just, I, I can't handle that stuff. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call him and let him know. But we're so glad to have Sister Cooper and our guests who are with us this morning to share in this time. And uh, grateful for the humble acknowledgments that come our way. And to all the glory and praise be to our God for he gives us uh, the reason for being, and we are grateful and appreciative. So thank God uh, for all of those uh, acknowledgments. And those who can, uh, support where you can, and let us see what we can do to be good uh, community partners one with another. So we're looking forward to that uh, event on the 27th, as well as next weekend, uh, Sister Yvette Williams, who uh, a lot of us, uh, unaware, Yvette has been very ill, very sick, and uh, we're so grateful for those who remember her and then who give us opportunity to share in her life and legacy. So if you would, it's going to be a wonderful event here 
on Saturday at noon, a good time to have church. And uh, so we're grateful. And I pray for me, uh, Brother Clussy and Brother Kenny. We're going down to Phoenix, Arizona this weekend. Uh, now, Deacon Clussy is used to traveling with me. Uh, this is going to be Kenny's first time traveling with us. So we're going to try not to scare him, Brother Kirk. And, uh, and make sure he has a wonderful experience at the Far West Regional Workshop. And our own Dean Kurt Harris is the Far West Coordinator for that effort and our state layman's president. Kirk, stand one more time. Let him see you. So pray, pray that God will, will strengthen him and, and help him have wisdom uh, to lead uh, from that way. We're praying for the Blackwell family this morning, the home going of Brother Blackwell. Uh, that the Lord has now gave him rest from his weariness and from his pain. And so we are praising God for his life. And now I pray for his family, that God will strengthen those, uh, those children. As now mom and dad are gone from time to eternity. Let's pray that God will strengthen them. I, I mentioned early in our gathering to remember um, Mother Eula Breland, if you would, and... Um, uh, Mother Mary Winters, and we've been jokingly laughing since last Sunday morning. Pray for Mother Cooper. Um, they lost her teeth. And so we're praying that they would find her teeth. And uh, so now, now you got to know Mother Cooper, y'all. Uh, Willie, Willie May is all right. She just, she said, they going to either find her some teeth or buy her some more. So, so, so we are praying that that situation gets together. Lynn Roberts is also traveling in the loss of an aunt in Louisiana. And so pray that they will have safe travels, if you will, there and back. Pastor Joseph is in Portland this morning at the Highland Christian Church sharing with them. Should be back hopefully this afternoon safe uh, that the Lord will bless them. So what I want you to do is get ready to just greet everybody that you haven't greeted. So just in your area, take time to inconvenience yourself just for a moment. Spend two or three minutes just greeting people and let them know. Glad to see you. I see guests who are here today. Make sure you let guests know that we're so grateful to have them in our presence. That's it. What a fellowship. y'all. Thank y'all so much. Yeah, thank God for you. Hey, while we're doing this, I also want to make sure that I reach out and I acknowledge the wonderful, diligent work 
of uh, our children's choir ministry. They did a wonderful workshop yesterday with our children. So grateful for that. And I concur, our ushers look wonderful today. Uh, thank, thank God for them. Our worship ministry is, is going to sing again, but let me do uh, what we do here on second Sundays. Uh, this year, remember, we started uh, last month our housing assistance uh, initiative. Each month, we try to help uh, a family, two of our congregation. And I want again today to receive these special gifts for that effort. I want to receive these special gifts for that effort. And um, so if you are able to give, um, let's just do we have a basket? Because uh, I want to make sure that our finance committee have opportunity to get this ready for me so that we can celebrate what the Lord is doing. We were able to help three families last month. And, uh, and it was a tremendous, tremendous blessing of grace. And uh, uh, remember, we don't do this out of ostentation. In other words, we don't, uh, we don't say what we had to do, got to do, should have done. The Lord said, let your alms be done in secret so that he may reward you openly. And so I need you to know, though, these are real needs from real people. And uh, I don't know if you've ever had a chapter in your life where um, you didn't look like what you was going through. but you was going through. <laughs> you know, we have, a, we, have a, uh, we have a way of putting a nice suit on trouble. Put a, put a nice dress on trouble. Brother Thomas will hold it. Let, let, let Thomas hold it, Clarissa. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can put a, a, a new hairstyle on trouble. Uh, but, but, it don't, but it don't mean I don't have trouble. Oh, I don't have some, some drama going on in my life. So what I want you to do right now, we're going to receive this. This is intentional. I want you to get a gift in your hand. I've already, I was, I was ahead of Brio this, this month. I, I did mine while I was sitting down. Uh, when I looked at the video last time, it took me too long <laughs> to give. <laughs> so I made sure I was ahead of the game. So I've already given $100 toward this effort again this month, along with our, so many, so many just ways to be a blessing to our youth initiatives, if you heard that, what we want to do for our youth. Also, we didn't tell you, but we gave uh, $1,700 to St. Jude Children's Hospital. And uh, somebody, somebody turned my mic down or did something. Yeah, who did that? Okay, it's back now. Okay. All right. And so there are so many things that we are doing from a mission standpoint. And remember, members of our fellowship, this is Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church. If there are no missions going on, then we may as well just be Tabernacle Baptist Church. But if we're going to be tabernacle missionary, then we want to make sure we're engaging efforts that matter. And missions have nothing to do with you. It's all about how can somebody else be blessed through me allowing God to make me a channel of blessing. Y'all, I don't know who hit them lights, but y'all about to give me a, a, a what that thing, a Caesar. Don't be changing them lights like that on my head. Don't do that. <laughs> keep it, keep it steady. Keep it, keep, keep it, keep it steady. All right, all right. So let's get, let's get ready to give. 
I want you to bow your heads. God, we thank you now for what we are about to do to be a blessing to someone. And as we bring these gifts to you for your use, fill our hearts with integrity and honesty and compassion. And already prepare the hand and the heart of those who will be receiving these helps. Smile on this effort according to your will. Now we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All over the room, let's stand and let's bring these sacrifices and these supports to the effort. Remember, if you're giving online, make sure you put a note, say housing assistance. 2024 housing assistance 2024 
with me always. So for that I'll sing. For that I'll shout. What a great redeemer. Hallelujah. 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 It's to your name. Is our God help me sing great? Great and mighty is our God. Is our God. Sing great and mighty is our God. We sing great and mighty is our God. Is our God. We sing great and mighty is our God. Is our God. We sing great and mighty and mighty is our God. We sing great and mighty. Cause how you lift it up is our God, is our God. How you lift it up is our God, is our God. How you lift it up is our God, is our God. How you lift it Great and mighty is our God, is our God. How we thank and praise Him. If you would bow your heads with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we come now to the moment of proclamation, we pray that you would make clear and firm your word. We pray that you would abate any distraction so that we may receive the instruction and inspiration that we need to live and be a witness in this present age. Breathe on us afresh, strengthen us physically for this task of preaching. Our mind, our hearts are yours. Help us, our infirmities. 
And now, Master, bless this room and those who listen virtually. Be glorified in it. We've hushed all the praise. will be yours. We declare it in your name. Amen. Flowers fade, grass withers, but the word of our God endures forever. Uh, the prophet was asked by the king, is there a word from the Lord? And he said, there is. Will you stand with me with your Bibles open or your app of your Bible to Revelation chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 from the ESV version of the text. From the ESV version of the text. Um, a name just popped in my head, and I want y'all to pray for her. Felicia Sherrill. I want you to pray that God would strengthen her. She has had great struggles over the last year or so. And uh, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus says he's come that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Pray for her. And for her son, that God will help them in this time of testing. The word of God reads, chapter 2, verse 24. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, do not lay, I do not rather, lay on you any other burden. Oh, thank God. Verse 25. Only hold fast what you have until I come. And the people said in agreement. Amen. Text is right there. What I have is worth holding. It's worth holding. I want you to I want you to humbly do something for folk who might not understand. Pinch it now. I want them to hear. I want you to just look at somebody and tell them so all of us can be on the same page. Tell them, get something <laughs> worth holding. If you don't already have it, you better get it. Mm. Grandma's church, you just say, I'm holding on to my faith and I won't let go. <laughs> Sister Ruby, you remember that I'm just holding on? <laughs> wow. Mm.
Arena. <risa> Allow me, if you will, to, to hurry and, 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 and move out of God's way. This, uh, this text, wow, this, this text comes to us on the heels of, if you remember, last month on Second Sunday, as we continue to traverse through these letters to the churches of Asia Minor, we preached about the abuse of mercy. And uh, how God had gave this spirit, personality of Jezebel, space to repent, but she would not. And we said that we need to be careful that when God gives us space to get right, to stop doing some things, or to start doing some things, we ought to use the space properly. Also, it dawned on me, uh, Sister Brenda Watson, as I read through the passage concerning the church at Thyatira, that it was a lengthy letter. It wasn't a, a short exposition, but it was a lengthy explanation to this church. And along with the previous two churches, there had been a recurring phrase, Deacon Clussy. It had to do with beware of the teachings of. Beware of the teachings of Balaam. Beware of the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And now at Mother Williams, it comes to beware of the teachings of Jezebel. And so it has been this continual exhortation of the Lord Jesus Christ saying to his church, beware of false teachings. And here in verse 24 was something that just literally rocked my little world. <laughs> He says, there are some of you who have not learned what some call, it's in your Bible too, the deep things of Satan. Yeah, frightening that is. That's scary that it is. Satan got some, some deep stuff. Hopefully by the time we finish preaching, you'll understand it's just simply saying, beware of his deceptions. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this notion of holding on to what you know and what you received 
It's so important for the body of Christ today because Jesus is commending this church he has rather prior to verse 24 about their love. He's rebuked them for tolerating the teachings of this spirit of Jezebel who was a real prophetess and who led many astray. Um, her teachings were that of sexual immorality along with idolatry. And Jesus warns that church to repent, listen, to repent of their tolerating of the teaching. In other words, it's going to happen. It's going to take place. People are going to say some crazy stuff. But is the church of Christ strong enough and mature enough not to tolerate the teaching? Hmm. And in the 21st century church, it seems like we, we become allergic to doctrines or teachings or principles of what it means to reprove someone, what it means to rebuke someone, what it means to give an exhortation to someone, an admonishment to someone. It's like, it's like the 21st century Christian skin is so thin. I, I mean, in the old church, the old saints would snatch you and sit you down. <laughs> And you wouldn't go nowhere. You wouldn't have no attitude. You wouldn't have no disposition. Somebody just grabbed you and told you to sit down somewhere. Now, I was one of those young people in church. For, for my young people who are here today, your pastor. I ain't always been this sacred. <laughs> and I can remember some of the old saints seeing me in my foolishness in church. Not my mother, but old saints would walk over to where me and my boys were sitting, pick us up in the middle of church, and bring us to sit with them for the remainder of the worship service. And we'd be looking with cracker eye tears and all this stuff at our mama, and our mothers would do like. And what was going to happen is, see, what had happened was, we had to deal with the saints in the sanctuary, but we knew after the benediction, we were gonna have to deal with mama for embarrassing her, that somebody had to come get us for doing things we didn't have business doing in the church. But it's hard in the 21st century to rebuke, reprove, and give exhortation and warning to 21st century. And we, we get so offended. I mean, y'all, what does it take for someone to say, baby, you need to, you need to put on something else when you come to church and you not get out of your mind. Who you think you are? I, I do what I do. Now, there's two sides to that. Now, if the person don't have nothing, go buy them something. So you ain't just being, you, you, you follow what I'm saying? You know, ask a baby what size you wear. God, you know, can I, can I meet you somewhere? Can I, can I sing you something? If, if you're tired of seeing him or her in the same thing, then be Christian and say, can I, can I help? Can I, can I do this? Are y'all with me here? Learn to challenge uh, unholy, unrighteous, unchristian conversations in the restrooms and in the hallways. Learn to say, even in your private homes, when now nah, that's enough. Now nah, that, that's that's enough. There's there's a there's a line that you can cross. Now y'all don't nobody like to have after church church more than the Manaway family. We talk about every part of church when we get home, but there comes a part when even we say to each other, nah, that's enough. Okay, that that's. I mean, we laugh now. We have a good time. You see that? You hear that? We go all in. But there comes a time when the line has to be crossed. And now, okay, now, that ain't fun no more. Now, we, we really need to focus. That, that we need to pray about. Because that was not just incidental. That was, that was hellish. That was, that was evil. That wasn't godly. And so you need to be able to make sure that you are not tolerating 
uh, false teachings, bad dispositions and attitudes when it comes to the body of Christ. He promises that if you would not tolerate the bad teaching, that he would give you a reward. So the letter to the church of Thyatira has these warnings. One, to remain faithful to the teachings of Christ. So you got to know Christ and his teachings so you can defend Christ and his teaching. You got to know what's true so you can know what's false. So if you don't know the truth, people can say anything to you. And then secondly, you need not tolerate the false immorals and the teachings of the 21st century believers. Y'all, mm, for, for lack of a better word, it's comfortable being a saint for some of us. You don't have to change nothing to be saved in 2024. You don't have to stop talking crazy, living crazy. You don't have to stop drinking as much. Smoking as much, sleeping around with as many folk as you want to. You, you, don't, you don't have to change nothing to be a Christian in, for some of us in the 23. It's just comfortable. And so we don't know nothing about count up the cost. What it means to take up a cross daily. And follow him if you want to be his disciples. Some of us have not broke out of a spiritual sweat yet. Being a saint has been easy for you. Still go to the same places, hang out with the same crowd, watch the same stuff, listen to the... Nothing has changed since you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're too comfortable with the culture and with this present age. And every now and then you ought to feel at least the Holy Spirit nudge you and say, uh-uh, 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 not, not, not that. When was the last time in the middle of a laugh about something that was not spiritual, the Holy Spirit said to you, and you heard him say, what, what, you, what you laughing about? That was not funny. That was offensive. That was unchristian. And here you are at work just laughing with folk and talking with folk because they laughing and stuff and they talking about stuff. And instead of you transforming your environment, you took the easy road and conformed. Thirdly, this letter to this church is about encouraging believers to persevere in the face of trials. You cannot be a saint in this life without every now and then having a trial, a tribulation, and tribulation work of patience. And patience of God does not let us be ashamed about who we are. It quickens our hope. And finally, the letter says, hold fast to the truth of what you have Receive. Now, you can't hold on to nothing you don't have. This is easy preaching. I, I, like, I, I like this kind. You got to have something, first of all, to hold on to. So, if you don't have the truth, the word of God, if you have not, as Psalm 119 teaches us, thy word, Brother Collins, have I hid in my heart that I might not, what, sin against thee. The word of God convicts. The word of God in your heart is that thing that the writer of Hebrews says is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts. Oh, my God. And it cuts thin. I mean, it separates stuff. It, it won't let you just go down a road blindly or ignorantly. It will always call you back to the truth. Always call you back to the truth. So if there is a... Uh, proposition to this wonderful word today and if I wanted you to remember one thing as we labored it would be this and you can write it down and that is this passage Revelation 2 24 25 teaches us that you have to decide to be the kind of Christian 
that does not yield to Satan's perversions or consider God's truth to be burdensome but remain faithful. You have to decide that you are not going to yield to his perversions nor consider God's truth to be burdensome. Remember he said my yoke is easy and my what? Burdens are light. Take, take it up on you. Learn of me. I, I, I'm meek and lowly. And I promise you that living for me won't kill you. Yeah. Yeah, my burdens are easy. You know, my yoke is easy. My burdens are light. And so the question then is, Minister Paul, how can we as Christians then guard against Satan's perversions and remain faithful to the truth? And in the word it says very clearly, yield to the exaltation. Somebody say yield to the exaltation. Look at verse 24, but to the rest of you. God, ain't that good preaching? Everybody has not sold out. Everybody has not backslid. Everybody has not accepted Satan's perversions. Everybody is not going. And, and you know, y'all, um, mm, Brother Kurt, you know, in a, in a few days, um, they're going to have me sitting on the panel down in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And one of the, of the prevailing questions they want to ask your pastor is, what do you think about the young people? <laughs> Where are young people in church after the pandemic? And for me, I say, well, I see some of them. I see young people in church. I, I see young people engaged in godliness. I see young people trying to live according to the word of God. I see young families, husbands and wives. I see young parents. I see young single men and women trying to live righteous and holy lives. I, I see them. So you, uh, to, to ask me where are the young people is, is almost an oxymoronic question because can say to you, you know, there may be some reasons why some of us don't experience having the presence of a young, and then who are you calling young? Because you can be 99 years old and still be a young believer. Talk to me somebody. You can be just starting your brand new life at age 70. And for God, you're a babe. You're a babe in Christ at 70 years old. So we talk about chronologically where they are. We talk about spiritually where are they. But what can we say? What can the church do to make Jesus Christ available to young people today? And one of the prevailing questions is what we're talking about. It ain't all of them. First of all, stop using this inclusive statement for all people everybody not doing it everybody not wicked every young person don't have a gun every young person not carjacking somebody every weekend every young person is not drinking and partying every young person is not living like you say all those no some of them Mm. Even Jesus says over 2,000 years ago, but to the rest of you, <laughs> ain't that something? He exhausts us to the rest of you. He's urging us. He's advising us to strongly make sure we're not captured by the message that is corrupt. Jesus is commending those in Thyatira who are not following the false teaching. Is there anybody here besides me today who really try to live the life you talk about? Hey, y'all, it it's, it's, not, it's not easy. It's not popular. Uh, uh, Elder Janice, I had to learn and still learning what it means to be shunned. Because there are just some things you won't do, you won't say, you won't participate in. Uh, even, even in my little circle of preachers, I, every now and then when I start walking to the group, I can hear the brother say, y'all shut up, here come RL. <laughs> Whatever y'all are talking about, we need to Turn it down now because our Ariel has, has, has showed up in it. I used to feel bad about that, but I don't now. 
I've learned that there are just some boundaries you have to set if you're going to be a child of God. There are just some things you won't cross. There are some things you won't do because there is a God inside of you who says, don't embrace it. They tell me it takes about 21 days to develop a habit new and only three to lose it. It's hard for you to develop a life where you learn not to listen to the wrong thing, participate with the wrong thing. It's to some of us therapeutically, Elder Janice, it's therapeutic. It's trauma. <laughs> do you know how traumatic the statement is? Things I used to do, I don't do no more. That's a traumatic statement. <laughs> Places I used to go, I don't, I, don't, I don't go no more. Associations I used to have, I, I, I don't have anymore. So, so if you're not doing that anymore, what are you doing? Who are you with? What now occupies that space where you used to have it filled with stuff that was not honoring the God? What's filled those places and things that you don't do anymore? I say to you, if you are not careful, you will find yourself yielding in to these deep things, these perversions of Satan, and we'll be hearing the Lord rebuke us and telling us, turn and hold fast to the things you've learned. Exhortation. Somebody say exhortation. I won't preach real fast, so let me pause for a minute then and talk about what is he meaning when he says these false teachings, the teachings of Jezebel, these uh, deep things of Satan, what would be considered some false teachings that the 21st century church needs to have our antennas up about. And one of the things is what we just finished doing a few moments ago, and that is in the area of prosperity. If you are not careful, in the 21st century, Satan can use a false prosperity gospel to lead you astray. It sounds like this. The prosperity gospel teaches that mm, financial blessings and physical well-being are connected to those, listen, who have enough faith. So in other words, those of us who don't have nothing, we don't have it because we don't have enough faith. So that's false. I know some people who don't claim to have any faith who are doing pretty good. Huh? And it often promotes a materialistic view of faith, and it can lead and manipulate and exploit believers, saying, I just got to believe. I got to believe, because if I believe hard enough, I can have. Y'all, look, there are some things that God in his divine will has just done. Look. Proverbs over and over tells you it's better to be an honest person and be hungry than to be a liar and have a roast. Okay, while you're sitting down and while I got your tent, let me go and get this out of the way. I don't think members of the tabernacle do this, but there are saints who chronically lie this time of year on their income taxes. They got dogs and cats with social security numbers. And seemingly, for some reason, they, they, they get by. There are saints. God, help me preach humble, Lord. Y'all, please. Y'all, I'm preaching from a pastor's heart. Look, y'all, I'm trying to tell you righteousness is better. Don't lie just to get food stamps or EBD card. Tell the truth. Give God space to work in your life. Don't, don't, don't lie to prosper. St. Proverbs teaches that when you get it by uh, unrighteous gains, it don't last long. Wealth take wings like a bird. Fly away. 
You have it now and tomorrow you won't have anything. Hey God, the prophet said until you do right with God, you can wait triple time. You can have three jobs, but your bag will have a hole in it. Now that's what he said. It's just a false teaching to say you don't have you don't have nothing because you don't believe hard enough. I'm looking at a whole bunch of faith, faithful people in here today. You believe God, you trust God, and don't let Satan spoil that for you. First uh, Timothy six nine and ten said, "Those who want to get rich." They fall in the temptation and are trapped and into many foolish and hurtful desires that plunge people into ruins and destruction for the love of money. Not money. Somebody say money is not evil. Say that out loud. Money is not evil. Get as much of it as you can. Enjoy it as much of it as you can the right way. But it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Don't love it till you would do anything to get it. Uh, second thing is something that's called hyper grace. H-Y-P-E-R. Look it up when you get home. Hyper grace is a false teaching that the 21st century church, this is one of the deep things of Satan. Hyper grace. The teaching emphasizes God's grace... <sighs> To the exclusion of the need for repentance and holy living. That's false. You must be. Got to be born again. You still have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe in your heart that God has raised his son Jesus Christ from the dead and be saved. Acts chapter 2 verse 38. They said, what must we do? Then, brethren, after hearing the gospel message, he said, repent and believe that Jesus Christ is who he is, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So anybody who tells you that you can have grace that saves without a need for repentance and then to live righteous after conversion is a false teaching. You've got to guard against this, uh, this arrogant spirit that says, I don't know why y'all trying to be so holy than I and live so right. I don't do all that stuff y'all do, and everything is all right between. Here it is, though, me and my Jesus. You've got to be careful of the ghosts you trust. Paul says... There are a lot of folk in the 21st century who have a form of godliness. But they deny the power therewith. God, the Holy Spirit, who comes to live inside of us once we are born again, is grieved when we don't live according to the testimony that we give. He convicts. He does. He convicts you that when you are not living right, not thinking right, not doing right, he won't let you sleep comfortably at night. He'll wake you up. He'll want to have a conversation with you. He'll push you. He'll urge you. He'll let you know you're breaking my heart, but I, I'm, I'm the minister. I'm here to love you. I'm trying to let you know that how you've been acting, and it ain't been godly. If you have not repented of your sins according to the scripture and not trying to live better, tell somebody what a smile is. I'm trying to live right. God am I. I'm, I'm, I'm. Try not to be so nasty and arrogant and all that. I'm trying to live better, y'all. Hmm. This hyper grace thing can lead to things where moral standards are degraded into the name of grace and we find ourselves doing what the last sermon was about and that is abusing mercy. 
Look at somebody real humble and say, uh, let's repent of our sins. And let's try to live like we've been born again. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, for those who need a pen, Sister Margaret and others. He says, <laughs> what shall we say then? Shall we continue sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? You got to reckon yourselves dead. Y'all, there are a whole bunch of things that, that, that as a person, your, your pastor want to do, try to do. I've been, I've been trying to drink a bottle of champagne in my house. It's about 21 years old. I look at it every night. It sits right in front of my, my uh, television there. And I know exactly where it is. even been closed over there. And every now and then, the, 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 the devil says to me, S -s 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 it, it, It's ready, not Reverend. Reverend, it, it's ready. But Junior, I know my proclivity. I, 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 I'm still afraid I can't sip. I didn't say you. I got the mic in my hand. I said, I'm afraid that I just can't sip. Ain't no sense in me getting a shot glass. There's a, there's a joke in my house with my family that I tell them if I ever open it, Y'all take my license, my keys, and everything that I can be identified by. Lock me in the bedroom. Post a guard and don't let me out of here so that I don't embarrass you, God, the church, or nobody. Now, if you listen to me, I'm telling you how afraid I am, not how proud I am. And I haven't had none in a while either. Okay. Hyper grace. If you're going to be saved, live like you're saved. And then there is this a false teaching called moral relativism. This is a doctrine in some churches with some individuals in the 21st century who have embraced the idea that moral truths are subjective and relevant, leading to a watered-down biblical system of ethics and principles. In other words, God saves me, then God leads me to myself, to establish my own levels of ethics. That's relative. Oh, help me preach. God, please help me preach good today. Y'all look, times change. Yes, they do. But there is a God who says, I don't. I. He was 13 and 8. I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But relative, moral relativism says, but what is current for today? What's relative for the 21st century? Y'all look, uh, uh, I've, I've lived in the 19, the 19th, um, I've lived a little while now, oh Jesus. You know, teenager of the 70s, a young man of the 80s, trying to find my way in the 90s, in the 2000s, got now here I am in the, in the 2024, in the latter part of my life, and now things that I thought in my, in, in my high school days, I just had to have, had to do, don't make, it's not relative. For my happiness, for my peace, etc. 
Stuff that God helped me preach good. Y'all look. Mm. Stuff that the church used to call sin. The church has become so relative. They don't call the same stuff sin. It used to call sin. Stuff that used to be unholy for the church. Not unholy for the church. And it has become more relative. Listen, y'all. We have to be careful. The deep things of Satan, his perversions, these deep things of Satan become so um, isolated and they become so sedated. They become so watered down. We become so neutralized. We lose our sting of, of truth until these relative um, uh, moral issues of the common age don't bother us. Like we, we, most of the church now are walking around talking about, well, you know, times have changed. But Jesus, his word, and true, and guess what? And he's holding us to the standard that hadn't changed. Not to the ones that we're comfortable with. Look, y'all. The church has to be the church even in the danger of being called the church. You can't be the church and be like the world. You have to be the church. At all costs. Talk to me, somebody. Now, there are some things in some, like I say, verse 24, some of them, not everybody, some, some have just sold out to this is the way things going to be to Jesus come. But that's not saying you're supposed to, you're supposed to change principle. You're supposed to change truth. You're supposed to change the things of God so that the world can be, you know, not one time that Jesus Christ changed the truth for sinners. And look, I love Jesus' style. He ate their pork chops, lamb chops, ate their bread, drank their wine, even invited himself to go home. He said, I'm going to your house tonight. I'm going to eat at your house tonight. And when he got there, he didn't change the truth just so he could eat. Yeah. 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 While sitting around their tables, Jesus stayed Jesus. And when Jesus stayed Jesus, even at their tables, they got it from their tables because of Jesus being real of who he was and said, Lord, hey, look, been watching you, man. If I've done anything, to misuse anybody, been unfaithful, been ungrateful. If I'd been unfair, said I will restore full force to anybody I've cheated. Sinners were repenting because Jesus didn't change. Remember the woman, John chapter 8, she's caught in the act of adultery. Y'all remember that story? The men bring, and every time I get there, I, I, I ain't going down that road. But to show you how religious they were, they didn't understand the doctrine or they ignored it. In a case when someone is caught in adultery, both parties are supposed to come. The man and the woman. Got it? Byron, they only bought the woman. And they had the audacity to say, we caught her in the very act. Now stay with me. Which is worse? Her adultery... Or the folk who were peeping in the window watching her have sex. Called to catch her in the very act. We saw her. We caught her, which should have been we caught them. And the man and the woman should have been standing in them asking Jesus, what shall we do to them according to the law? No wonder Jesus stooped down. You hear us, Jesus? Mm -hmm. What you gonna do? Here. Here. Jesus now gets 
to, to the real teaching of the whole thing. He said, the same scripture that you just used to bring her here that you misinterpreted. I want to show you the true intent. Now, here's the stone. You're right. Moses did say this. But whoever throws this first stone, <laughs> I'm about to holler and run around this room. You can't be guilty of what you finna stone her about. From the oldest to the youngest. Which mean they had been playing some Jodies. Ain't no sense in going home. Throw it if you are not guilty of the same sin. Moral relativism. Jesus is left alone with that woman. Where are your accusers? Lord, I have none. All right, church. Watch the integrity of our Christ. He does not pat that woman on the back and say, girl, go be careful. Don't do your stuff so, you know, loose. You know, if you're going to do it, you know, keep it. <laughs> I know you got to work, you know. Jesus don't do that. Jesus said, go and sin no more. See, that's the relative part that Satan don't want you to get to the deep things. He wants you to keep measuring your righteousness by somebody else's and not God's. So this is about the third week in a row where you've heard me say, it's not enough for you to say, I don't cuss as much as he does, but you still cuss. I'm not as nasty as she is, but you're still nasty. I'm not as arrogant as they are, but you're still arrogant. If you're not using Jesus and God's word as your standard, your standard is too low. And our moralities would never become relevant to the word of God. They will always remain relevant to the world and the society and the culture we live in. And we will be guilty of not holding on to what we know is right. One more and I quit. Syncretism. It's another false teaching that the church got to watch out for. This is where some churches blend different beliefs and practices from various religions and worldviews that inadvertently lead to a distortion of Christian doctrine. And they give us a delusion of the uniqueness of Christ. In other words, any religion that makes Jesus just a good man is a false teaching. Any religion that says he was a great prophet but not God is a false teaching. Any teaching that says Jesus was not divine he was not holy. He was not sacred. It is a false teaching. You got to be careful, saints. When you have a temptation to make Jesus your best friend and not your Lord. This doctrine of uh, syncretism, it, it says like back in Exodus 20 and 3, you should have no other God before me. Now, let's just preach and I'll take my seat. That don't mean just a God. Some of us have made our spouses God. Our parents God. Our children. There are, there are some parents that worship children. Some of us have made our jobs, our careers, 
our gods. Some of us even worship our cars, our automobiles, things that are going to pass away, things that have no sadistic qualities at all. We have made them gods. God said, you have no other God before me. John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father except he come through me. Any teaching that tells you you can get to God and you can have eternal life without Christ is a deep thing of Satan. He is trying to snatch something from you. He's trying to steal eternal life from you right from under your nose. He does not want you to believe who God is. There is universalism that says that all people ultimately will be saved, reconciled to God, and irrespective to their belief, their actions. The, the, they, they say that there's no need to have a personal faith in Christ and that you can diminish the uh, urgency of evangelism. You don't need to be saved because everybody is ultimately going to God universally. That's a false teaching and a deep thing of Satan. And then finally, there's this idea of having a self-help gospel. Oh, this is a fine line right here. Because everybody ought to think well of themselves. You ought to have a healthy image of yourself. You ought to have a good perspective about what yourself. But not when it crosses the line of making yourself more important than God that made you. So the teaching focuses excessively on self-improvement, self-success, positive thinking, and sometimes at the expense of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It leaves out or it waters down the need to repent of sin and salvation only through Christ because I can do something that God can do for me. We find this in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 89 where Paul says to the Christians of Ephesus, he says this, for it's by grace you have been saved. It's through faith in Jesus Christ, not of yourself. It is a gift from God that nobody can boast about. In my conclusion, the denial of the authority of Scripture brings the 21st century church to her knees. It causes us to say, you don't have to believe the Bible. Oh, here, here's where the preaching get interested. There are some in the 21st century who've already begun to buy into that deep thing of Satan they, they, they have took away Deacon Kurt Harris, the inerrance of Scripture. And they have now infiltrated the mind of some that you know there are errors in the Bible. That, that, that's, not, that's not really what it means. There are even some that say that the Bible is not a sacred book. It's just good reading. Literature of an ancient people and an ancient language. That there are some that say, no way can the God of these words, the God of this Bible, be a person I need to repent, give my life to. And he was so murderous himself. Why should I trust this kind of God? Why should I trust the authority of this scripture? And in the 21st century, that's been one of Satan's greatest achievements. Some of us hardly ever consult the word of God. We're driven now to horoscopes. We're driven to self-help writings. We're driven to everything but to say, Lord, what do you say about my situation? In my conclusion, to deny the authority of the scripture, according to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which clearly says that all scripture is God breathed. It's useful for teaching. It's useful for rebuking. The word of God is useful for correcting. And the word of God is useful for training in righteousness. So then the, the servant 
of God does not need to be ashamed. But the word of God will equip you to every good work. In my conclusion then, may I say that if you're going to hold on to what you receive, first of all, you need to spend time with the book. Jesus said to the disciples one day there in the Gospel of John, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. He was saying to them, you know, you got to know what I taught and you got to believe what you've heard. And knowing the truth has a way of delivering you from any falsehood you may face. So may I say to you today with joy in my heart. Hold on to what do you know. And don't let anybody cause you to let go of the truth God gave you. Can I get a witness here? Tell your heart every time Satan comes to steal the truth away from you. Tell him, I prayed too hard to lay my hands on the truth of God's salvation. When he comes to disturb the sanctity and spirit of your relationship, tell him I decided to make Jesus my choice. Do you hear me? Because I want to be included in the phrase that says, not all of them. <laughs> Do you hear what I said? I want to I wanna be able to say, I fought a good fight. I want to be able to say, I kept the faith. Ooh, I want to be able to say, I finished my course. And when the Lord shall call my name, I want to I wanna be able to, to say to the Lord, I did my best. And I want to hear the Lord say to me, Well, done thy good and faithful servant do you hear what I'm saying if you feel the way I feel look over to the person sitting next to you tell them with affirmation and joy say neighbor I don't know you feel about it, but I decided I'm gonna hold on a little while longer. I'm gonna mind, keep my mind and my eyes staying on Jesus. I have determined to set my boundaries, to put down my fence posts. I determined there's some things. I won't say some places I won't go some companions I won't keep yeah, some things I won't entertain because I want to be included in the number that said you did not bow to the end you did not lose your faith in God. All right. I want to I wanna be one of them that stands on my Mariah and say, let the God that answer by fire, let him be God. I want to hold on to the fire of God. Rain down. Yeah. I want to hold, hold on to what I know. Oh, help me preach somebody. Look at the person sitting behind you and say, neighbor, I'm not the smartest person on the planet. Oh, neighbor, I don't have... Some of y'all
y'all still looking at me, look at somebody and tell them if I say, I don't have a lot of alphabets behind my name. Neither I did not go to an Ivy League school. I did not graduate cum laude, but I made it with thank you, Lord. Y'all don't hear me? So it's getting away that stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of my suffering and my shame. They hung my Jesus between God and the earth. He died, died, died to the rocks went. Till the sun stops shining and the moon hymns rocks ripped curtain split somebody said the rock quite like a drunken man he died I mean he know he did put him in the grave y'all don't need me now put your preaching voice on when you tell somebody Yeah. <laughs> 
until he comes. Find somebody, just tell him, he's on the way, he's on the way. You just gotta hold on till he come. Don't, don't let the relative seculars tell you times have changed. Don't let the universalists tell you we all God's children. And no matter what we've done, we all gonna make it. No need to, don't, don't, don't listen. Be not deceived. Accept the man. Jesus told Nicodemus, be born again. He cannot, he will not see the kingdom of God. Wow. Only hold fast what you have until I come. Aren't you glad today that you are included in that wonderful statement of verse 24? But to the rest of you, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know who's quit. I don't know who gave up. I don't know who gave in. But to the rest of you who did not buy in to the deep things of Satan. Listen, I, I, I'm sorry, y'all. I was pre I happy. But I need to say before I sit down this, verse 25, Jesus said, listen, just to Janice. He said, I'm not going to put no other burden on you. God wants you to make it. And he don't want it to be hard to get there. Just hold on to what you know is true. Listen, Byron, listen again, baby. If you just hold on to the truth, Jesus said, I don't have any other requirement. I'm not going to burden you with nothing else. Just hold on to the truth till I come. Persevere and watch God. Look, if you're here today and some of the things you've heard resonate in your heart, I want to invite you to, to come and accept this Christ. Not another moment of hesitation. Not another moment of debating with yourself. I want you to come and say, Lord Jesus, I am so sorry. Listen, for letting stuff and things and people get in my way. Satan is a master of causing confusion. It has been my experience that some people, as they struggle to find Christ, they say, it was so much going on in my head. I didn't know what to believe. Believe the truth. Believe what Jesus Christ has said to you, towards you. Things that make for life and not death. And trust him. And so if you're here today and you want to get your relationship with Christ started, Paul says to the Christians at Rome, chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God and if you've heard him today I want you to come come quick now I'm talking about somebody who wants a relationship with Christ come on go on and sing baby
you need a church home, come on. You need fellowship with a body of believers. And you need a church home. You need somewhere to call home. Come on. Is there another? I, I need a church home, Pastor Manaway. I need to belong somewhere. Somewhere I can grow in grace and in the knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if you're out of fellowship, come. I mean, if you're visiting and you're just here for a season, we'll be glad to share with your pastor, work out some watch care for you while you're in the city, in the area of studying or working. Just make sure you have a covering and that you don't leave the way you came. And that you may be that person who needs prayer, strength for the journey. Why don't you come? And just let the church pray for you and pray with you so you can be strengthened as you go through this walk of life and find it hard to hold on to what you have received. Come on and just give it to